Welcome DOD Innovators. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. I am Captain Ashley Hollingsworth, Chief of the Director's Action Group at the Department of the Air Force, CDAO. As your moderator, I am thrilled to be part of this month's Innovation Connect. Before we dive in into today's topic, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. If you are not a presenter, please keep your camera off and your microphone on mute. If someone has a live microphone while our speaker is presenting, please allow the moderators to mute that microphone. We have had a few instances lately of attendees inadvertently muting the speaker, and we'd love for that not to happen. Also, please limit your question to today's topic and avoid media-related inquiries or commercial-like pro uh, promoting. Finally, your questions for the speaker can be submitted through the chat. Today's presentation will highlight the System of Systems Technology Integration Tool Chain for Heterogeneous Electronic Systems, also knows it, known as Stitches, a tool chain and platform that acts as a library of technical standards and translations. In practice, one application sends data or instructions into Stitches, which then processes it into the standards of your next system. Stitches leverages system specifications to optimize, transform, and auto-generate an executable binary that provides efficient interoperability at runtime. Without further ado, let me introduce our, our esteemed speaker. Today, we are honored to have Dr. Jimmy Rev Jones, a retired USAF test pilot and combat veteran employed as a wild weasel flying seed missions in Operation Iraqi Freedom. He has flown F-16s as a test pilot and operationally in Germany, South Korea, and at Edwards Air Force Base, and he has he has more than 2,000 hours flying in over 30 types of aircraft. Dr. Jones earned a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the University of Illinois, a master's and doctorate in electrical engineering from Arizona State University, and a second master's in flight test engineering from the U.S. Air Force Test Pilot School. Dr. Jones was the Air Force Chief of Advanced Countermeasures for three years while leading advanced integration efforts at Headquarters Air Force Special Program. He served as a DARPA Program Manager for five years within the Strategic Technology Office, working on information theory-based electronic warfare, human on the loop, automated and resilient air operation center battle management, automated cooperative counterpart aircraft, and manned unmanned teaming algorithms, learning the transfer of AI, and the system of systems integration technology and experimentation program, creating secure by design emergent capability from fielded systems by developing and employing the Stitches integration tool chain and platform. Dr. Jones is currently the DAF Stitches program manager and leads the Stitches warfare a warfighter application team known as SWAT, Integration Prime, and Project Battering RAM, which digitizes, modernizes, and integrates the security classification guide process directly to data. He also co-leads the Bravo Hackathons, which you may recall being profiled by our very own SAF CN's Stuart Wagner and Associated AI and Data Battle Labs. We are excited to hear from our distinguished speaker today. Sir, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. That was a, that was a great introduction and uh, I'll, 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 I'll scrub it for, uh, for less buzzwords next time. I apologize. Uh, but uh, actually, so I'm, I'm in Germany right now where uh, we're doing the, um, and I'll, I'll share my screen here. Um, hopefully the bandwidth serves me well. Um, if it doesn't, uh, please uh, interrupt me and I will slow down or whatever it takes to get it. Um, uh, currently, uh, like I said, I was in uh, I'm in uh, uh, Germany uh, prepping for uh, the next round of uh, Bravo um, hackathon uh, um, iterations with UCOM uh, and the battle labs, the data battle labs uh, out here. Um, but uh, the the core capability that uh, that really I work on is how do I how do I get things in the DoD to 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 communicate uh, and interoperate 
um, without having to force changes on, on these systems. Um, a, a lot of the, uh, the kind of MO or the, uh, the, 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 um, the, the intent that I have uh, with, uh, with the work that, uh, that uh, we got going on is um, I, I flew OIF, um, Operation Iraqi Freedom, night two in, uh, in the first 60 days of, uh, uh, of the war um, uh, doing the Wild Weas mission. Um, our stuff didn't work um, together then where uh, what, what, what was required of the actual humans, the people in the cockpits for any of these things is the human the gray matter was the fusion engine, was the collection uh, device to go and sw swap between screens uh, to be able to parse data from one system to another to, to very efficiently state over the radio in the, the minimum amount of, uh, of, of comm required uh, or a high uh, low degree of Shannon, Shannon entropy, if you will. Um, uh, uh, things that my, my co uh, cohorts needed immediately. Unfortunately, 20, 25 year, years later, not much has changed. Um, sure, we've got F-22 and F-35, but the, in terms of interoperability, we're, we, we still have a long way to go. Um, so that, that's where, that's where I, I kind of reside. Um, there's going to be a lot of information um, presented here, uh, as long as or short as you want to go. Uh, so what I'll do, if you, if you don't mind, um, is, is just periodically ask if there are any questions, uh, because uh, of all the different topics we'll cover, um, no doubt you'll, you'll have uh, hopefully some, some BS flags to throw. Uh, I love interaction um, uh, and just questions in general. So if that's fair with uh, with you all, um, we'll uh, we'll get going. Um, any questions so far? <laughs> but uh, there, there's plenty of people that uh, that built this brief, um, recognizing that this is uh, this is going going to go on the interweb. Um, uh, this is this is obviously a distro a um, public release type thing. So um, I, I I like to think that I have a lot of material that uh, talks about the generalities or uh, uh, the abstraction problems. Uh, anything related to the specific details of hey I want this specific system uh, to talk to this can can I do that? Um, I, unfortunately, uh, just in the the distro a uh, version uh, we can't talk about those. But feel free to send me a note, ask questions later, uh, and we'll get back to you and answer those questions. Um, there's uh, and, and I want uh, I'm presuming a couple of different things from from the crowd that that's here. Uh, one, everybody's a nerd. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a nerd, full tilt nerd. Um, uh, and everybody's got some sort of nerd in them. Um, but uh, besides uh, besides being various levels of, uh, of geeks on stuff um, uh, that, that you're you're likely in positions of, uh, of leadership or interact with uh, with leadership uh, to to be able to describe complex things in a very simplistic way. Um, I tell you, that's, that's not tends to be my strong point because I have to go the span of, of high level overview all the way down to the weeds. And it's very difficult to explain this topic in succinctly um, uh, so everybody can understand. Meaning we all speak software differently. So I'll try to uh, phrase things a couple different ways, um, uh, but by no means, I assume that, uh, that, that there should be questions. Uh, please ask them. If, if you haven't seen this chart, um, this is uh, this is called the uh, uh, the Augustine chart. It's basically a way uh, that uh, that's been figured out over time. If you're familiar with Rand, Rand does this very well of being able to uh, to describe how much per pound or uh, based on uh, weight uh, an aircraft does cost, has cost, and should cost. Um, this is a way to describe, not explain, but describe how long our systems, uh, our our major weapon systems, at least in terms of aircraft, have taken to uh, uh, to get to inner, uh, in, uh, initial operating capability or IOC. Um, and there's, uh, I'll throw out a couple of hypotheses for the, uh, uh, the senior level, uh, type, uh, typing Clyde that, uh, that someplace right around the, the late, uh, uh, 1970s, early 1980s, we, we hit this point, uh, in the time that it took to field something to initial operation capability where generally it was around five-ish years to now it's linearly increasing over time. Um, uh, I'll talk about the reasons for that in a couple of seconds, but what regresses unfortunately well is it's not limited to one type of aircraft. You, you might think it's like, well, sure, uh, um, uh, fighter aircraft are getting more complex. It's like, well, C-17's in there. I didn't think it was all that complex uh, until I flew one and realized there's a whole lot of information systems or at least electronic systems that have to interact. Fly-by-wire was... Um, uh, was a thing then, but uh, uh, for for big aircraft, uh, it's quite a bit different. Uh, the B2s in there, clearly, that was uh, our first uh, 
um, not our first, but uh, but uh, but a large uh, large scale bomber that's uh, um, that's LO, uh, and then uh, fighter variants in V22, um, highly complex in terms of flight control system. So these things have been growing over time, so much so that in the 19-ish years that it took from uh, uh, from the first contract, and that's how these things are measured from the date of the first contract all the way to the date it was it was considered uh, IOC or labeled IOC. Uh, in the same amount of time, uh, I'll show you in the next slide, it, uh, it took uh, the, the adversary that it was designed to interop, um, interoperate in and around uh, basically six iterations in that same time, meaning that uh, while, while we took one uh, the first version to fly out, um, uh, the, the adversary that, we, uh, uh, that, that, that helped drive some of the requirements um, uh, iterated six different times. Um, you're, you're probably more than familiar with, uh, by the time we field things, uh, things aren't, uh, uh, uh there's DMS to the mission material supply. Um, so, um, so we have to refresh. So what does it also mean? Um, that we are in a constant state of change. Um, change is about the only constant that we have. Obviously the value or the absolute value of that is different for everybody. Um, but there's never a time where we are static. Uh, and what's uh, I think more important and uh, maybe more insightful um, is that uh, the the number one driver of any of our requirements isn't us. It's the adversary. The adversary has a say in what we buy um, because if it if it's not in relationship to the adversary, we question ourselves why we're why we're buying it. But uh, but to go uh, to, to go maybe uh, just to, to seed some some thoughts. Um, uh, right around the late 1970s, just a couple of observations. Uh, that was around the time that. Um, the uh, the uh, 5000 series or uh, basically the uh, the new acquisition cycle took hold. Um, so that could be a reason. I'm not asserting anything, just just observations about this knee in the curve. Um, uh, Nancy Leveston, Dr. Nancy Leveston uh, up at MIT, uh, she does the uh, um, STPA, um, basically uh, secure by design um, uh, flight control systems, et cetera. Um, she hypothesizes that uh, uh, that's the same point that we started outsourcing all of our uh, talent of system to systems uh, to, uh, to to companies and basically lost that brain talent inside of the DOD uh, and basically gave it to somebody else to go do. Now, whether or not that's directly attributable or just an observation point, uh, sure. Uh, also around that late 1970s, it uh, was a higher order language program, uh, which preceding that, uh, there was uh, around 400 or 450 different computers or compiler languages uh, that, that we created ourselves in the DOD to go manage our, uh, our, our systems that were inherent to, uh, to our uh, uh, to our larger system. I don't want to call them major weapon systems because things were all sorts of different. Uh, uh, lastly, on this, the higher language program um, basically created the ADA programming language, uh, and arguably that was the last time that the DoD required um, uh, inherently deep level um, systems to system knowledge or or microelectronics level, if, uh, if that's if that's the proper categorization. Um, uh, in order to, 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 to create compiled languages. Uh, we abstracted it out and we, uh, we started higher, um, using higher languages. Again, there's all kinds of different reasons that this curve may be true, but the fact is this is an observation. So what's, what's our kind of, uh, what, why did I tell you all that? Um, well, since the DOD it still does and likely will always create uh, MWS lock systems, we try and put in the DOD wise, um, as much capability as we can into our MD, M, uh, MWSs. Uh, and it's not that we want to create moats. Moats uh, or boundaries to our systems that we create are, are natural occurrences because of funding limitations, funding lines. Even if a program was fully funded, you're still going to have a boundary condition around that system or that major weapon system that it only does certain things that it uh, an aircraft isn't going to sail. Is, is going to uh, uh, an Air Force aircraft isn't going to solve uh, problems for the Navy or vice versa. Um, so, given the fact that uh, that we have natural boundaries, there are very few uh, agencies, if 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 more than two, I'd be surprised, that are actually um, uh, tasked with how do you do interoperability in between those boundary conditions for our major weapon systems. Matter of fact, uh, uh, it's been fairly consistent that we have about 2,400 programs a record per year in the DOD, um, and which equates to about $250 billion, which does vary. If you were to go through as, as a program manager in one of those uh, to get through all the lists 
in one of your years, the 1920 hours that you have scheduled for your 40 hour work week, you could only spend an hour on the phone each before you had to go restart. So there's very little way that um, we can end squared our way uh, to being able to create interoperability through them. So what we're uh, to transition uh, now to uh, what our task was inside of DARPA that we created uh, this this capability, this interoperability, is that we are inherently um, tied to what's called the knapsack problem. When when somebody when there's a there's an event that occurs on Earth that we go uh, and find ourselves involved with, uh, we only have what shows up to that particular fight, to that particular AOR, uh, to go uh, to go fight or to go uh, employ effects through, uh, which generally speaking aren't part of your uh, your integration cycle um, that uh, that created those. So our uh, our fundamental goal is how do we create capability by creating custom um, effects or kill chains between those as is, as deployed systems in times that are relevant enough uh, to matter for that operation they're in. Um, uh, generally speaking, that's around 60 days from uh, warning order to diamond deployment uh, is, is, uh, is pretty much, uh, uh, is, it's driven by logistics all the way back to, uh, to World War I. Um, uh, and, and there's a whole lot of other factors go in there. More specifically, uh, we wanted to measure how fast we actually needed to create a system of system, meaning that if we created one and we took a, a year to go do it, um, how long has the adversary taken historically to be able to counter an effect? Uh, and it turns out that that's generally about 90 to 180 days um, uh, going all the way back to uh uh, to World War II, to include uh, Vietnam era, the, uh, those data uh, or the, that those numbers don't include any of the modern data sets um, just because of the classified. Uh, but but uh, that's this is the slowest it's going to go. Arguably, it could go to days to weeks, certainly turn on the news uh, and see any of the uh, the cat and mouse cycles that are going on between the two uh, two major uh, actions that are that are going on right now. So to be able to create a system of system or a capability out of the integration of system of systems, we wanted to go basically less than 60 days, which kind of coincides to deployment schedules, deployment cycles, uh, as well as the countermeasure measure cycle. Um, yeah, any questions or uh, um, comments uh, thus far? Uh, I don't see the chat, so in case there are, I don't see it. Cool. Um, if I are, just interrupt, please. Um, so what what is the problem with uh, with many of our interoperability? Well, if uh, if if you adhere to um, the, uh, uh, the 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 inherent desire uh, in our DoD and probably amongst us uh, to create standards to to no kidding standardize interaction between things. Um, standards are a lagging tool, meaning that whatever standard comes out um, is generated by requirements. Generally speaking, two to three years preceding that signature. It takes about two to three years to get a standard um, in its place. If, if any of you had the uh, the horrific opportunity to be on a standards board, um, there, there's a lot of politics just involved in that. What's politics? Uh, the last one to leave a, uh, a standards group is is what uh, who gets put in. You have a good argument. If you just have a bad day and can't argue, your stuff doesn't go in. Um, so uh, there's certainly a lot of math that goes in, involved in these, but it, but in the end. Um, uh, it is a lagging system that uh, that is the best guess, uh, or the best analysis that uh, it could be, and then it staffs. Um, so, but we didn't want to be ad adherent to having to create a new standard. Um, so, another methodology that's used um, throughout uh, uh, the world currently um, is this notion of, uh, of of knowledge graphs and how do you relate one thing to another without actually having to. Uh, 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 to go through an intermediate standard, which we'll talk about here in a second. Uh, but global standards, uh, when, when there are global standards, global standards, frankly, aren't global. They're only global to a localized region. If you have uh, one thing that's, uh, that, that's, a, that's a standard inside the Air Force, it's likely not going to be used inside the Navy because they have different contexts to theirs. Um, or if you want to talk about the difference between conventional and nuclear, um, the, uh, I, I don't even need to go into the details there, as, as you, you all might have scar tissue from just making those two communities work not even the, the technical aspect. So um, a, a note on standards, uh, which, uh, which, which this, this might strike uh, uh, folks uh, right to the heart, is they, uh, mil, the mil specs and the mil standards, the way we know them today, really came out right after World War II. When, uh, when, when Allied tanks and um, uh, US tanks uh, wanted to swap parts uh, or aircraft, et cetera, 
uh, there wasn't the uh, the ability to do so because of just uh, um, different specifications we're adhered to or not even the spec, uh, spec thereof. So after World War II, there basically was this effort to standardize uh, as many things as we could. And certainly there were specs preceding World War II, but, uh, but these were specs that were supposed to be uh, for, for all of our allies for sure. Um, and generally speaking, we did a good job. We created about 1,000 a year all the way up to about 2003 or sorry, 1994, when uh, when it uh, it got so out of hand with the n squared problem, meaning that all of these different combinations of standards, specifications, and requirements came out that nobody could actually consistently adhere to anything. So if if you're ever familiar with the time that uh, uh, that's kind of alluded to and stated that uh, that we had a, a divorce, if you will, from the uh, specifications as requirements. To specifications as you got to select them. That was that came out of uh, 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 Bill Perry's uh, 1994 edict uh, that basically separated those two out and 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 challenged and imparted on the, uh, the DoD uh, requirers and uh, program offices uh, to actually worry about uh, the the requirements uh, the determination phase of of the requirements process uh, to to come up with what we needed rather than actually adhering to, to raw standards. Now, I don't know how good we are today because I don't have a good unit of measure. Uh, people actually are still looking at how many are today, but within t- uh, 10 years, about half of those approximately uh, were reduced. Um, I'd argue that we've actually increased over time, but but every uh, what, what I really mean by, uh, by showing this is that nearly everything that we produce is adherent to some standard. But we, we observed uh, in the past, uh, 20, 30 years ago, that we couldn't have consistent um, standards or globally consistent standards overall. So we parsed these things out to smaller and smaller, higher optimized type sets. Um, another comment that we also get when we start trying to make work thing, uh, things work together, uh, you might maybe some of the uh, folks that are on here. So we want to work like the internet. It's like, well, if that were true, my alma mater, one of them is, uh, is uh, University of Illinois. Uh, NTSC created Mosaic, which then become uh, became uh, Netscape Navigator, which then became Internet Explorer once it get bought out by uh, Microsoft, which was just killed last year. Um, and uh, if you're familiar with Flash, uh, anything, any website that was Flash based that uh, before it was killed, if you go back there now, won't even load up. I've got network equipment at home in order to be able to use a KVM um, that uh, that can't work anymore because the internet uh, has 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 removed that to access because of the vulnerabilities. Uh, internet or not internet, uh, the iPhone. The iPhone basically asserts four compatibilities for every uh, uh, every deployment that comes out. Usually one ahead and two behind. So if you have an app uh, on your current uh, current phone, iPhone 15, which is a uh, uh, new and improved with its USB-C. Um, uh, how do you actually get uh, an iPhone one app uh, to, to play? Uh, the bottom line is there's no assertion of cat- compatibility with those. So if we actually did make things work like the internet and the DoD, we would throw out everything preceding uh, the, the F35 because everything is older, uh, not than dirt. Some of the things are, the B-52 still lives long and uh, prosper. Uh, but but this, is, this is the landscape we have to interoperate. Uh, last thing before I div- d- dig into the tech, there, there was a there's a key insight that uh, that was that was made in the commercial world uh, that we've taken advantage of. And if you recall um, or at least have heard about the famous or infamous blue screen of death um, uh, uh, problem that Microsoft had um, that uh, that when USB came out, not USB one, but the USB which is essentially one when they tried to plug a uh, device, um, uh, I think it was a, uh, what I said here, uh, a printer or a, a scanner um, up to the uh, the system, it, it crashed in front of everybody. Now, that was an example of two open APIs, open API, no, likely the proprietary sense, I understand that, uh, but then somebody that created the interoperability of the glueware between them, they call the device driver, um, that, that were allowed to access components uh, of each other that were in violation of basically written rules that people assumed that were written down that you're going to follow. So what was done for the the, the three years after that is basically uh, three different uh, um, attempts and, and ways uh, to, to to solve this problem. 
And the way that uh, that be, uh, was the most successful and is still in use today was a formal methods approach uh, to identifying and writing down the APIs of each of the two uh, systems. Um, in this case, the the USB, not that of the device, but the USB infrastructure that was uh, was part of it. Uh, and then they use those formal methods and formal methods, formal verification. If you recall your ninth grade hated geometry classes with proofs, proofs are to geometry as formal methods are to computer science. Um, unfortunately, formal methods don't can encompass everything. Uh, they don't uh, they don't do well with uh, uh, with things that uh, that require state or knowledge of the past. But they do extremely well with uh, with things that are stateless uh, or being able to to reason over things like um, uh, that that don't require past history. Uh, but because of this, uh, and, and we could probably all grimace uh, from this next comment, uh, the blue screens of death were virtually eliminated, at least for the context of device driver mismatch. They even found things uh, that were inoperable, but allowed to connect for devices, for instance, the, the floppy drive uh, that had a case um, uh, that, that wouldn't hardly ever have been achieved, but they were able to find it just through formal verifications. And we've largely included that um, into the processes that, uh, that we use, not only to, uh, inside of Stitches, but also our workflows for security. Meaning, if you've ever heard of the OSI um, uh, stack or the seven layer stack, uh, that is the internet or systems, you have the application layer, transport layer, physical link, et cetera. That is um, uh, oddly not actually used, but it's a model uh, to suggest what, uh, what your layers could be. The internet was a four-layer stack, uh, the original ARPANET, now it's a five-layer stack. But each one of these uh, these companies, the OEMs, uh, original equipment manufacturers, that produce a piece of equipment um, uh, basically has their own notion of stack. If you're truly going to be interoperable between different layers, then there's this notion of, uh, of, of data copy between them, uh, which means every time that you want to swap a layer out um, and have it truly separable, um, you have to copy data from one to the other. So the more layers you have, the more time in your system you're taking up with latent uh, data rights and uh, data uh, data copies uh, and data throughput. So the fewer stacks you have, the 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 more throughput you can get. But the fewer stacks you have, the less componentized it could be for for a horrible word. Uh, but what we're able to do is capture basically the APIs uh, or the uh, the the messages that are required to control every one of the systems we wish to make interoperable and to basically what we call make a Lego block of things. Um, that we're, we're taking our subsystems um, that, that's throughout, whether it be a radar, whether it be a data link, a link 16, um, uh, an electronic warfare system, et cetera. Um, we're able to break those components down in the same way that you might consider model-based systems engineering to be able to do that, but for the as-is delivered components, figure out how it works, figure out what its properties and boundary conditions are, and then encode that into a knowledge graph. And uh, this would be the last chart I go over before I ask for questions, and I'll continue. Um, our approach is the knowledge graph. And if you've never heard of a knowledge graph, um, if, you, if you picture a relational database like Excel um, or a spreadsheet that has rows and columns, at least two dimensions, uh, and every row is related to a column somehow, um, if, if you only have a certain amount uh, or very few, it's called a sparse uh, set of relationships, maybe uh, out of 10 by 10, uh, the full uh, full one, uh, 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 100 uh, possible combinations, or not possible combinations, but, uh, but interactions you can have. Uh, if you only have two or three, uh, that's a very sparse data set. What a graph is, is just relating the things that interact rather than having to, uh, to copy all the null values of the things that don't. Um, that's the thing in the far right. So uh, why, why show this chart? This chart was made by Dr. Michael Zatman. He used to be at OSD. Now he's uh, back in the uh, uh, in the, uh, uh, the private world. Um, uh, but what this was uh, was a was a was an alteration, or at least a, um, a different version of what we'd normally describe. Um, but the common approach is the center. We create a uh, a set of um, uh, uh, of standards. Uh, we we make everybody um, adhere to that standard. Works very well for. Um, for uh, immediate interoperability, uh, because you can adhere to that. But what happens when your uh, your real standard 2525 or your symbols change, uh, and your system is black and white, and you're transferring to color, or you want to communicate data from 
uh, one uh, command and control node uh, to another command and control node that uses two totally different um, uh, data management schemes, uh, which is which is the state of our C2 systems. Um, it's like, well, that global model, while it gives you great, efficient initial interoperability, it also becomes a data filter because if your data model prevents you from sharing data um, uh, across a network uh, that that isn't uh, isn't more um, uh, precise than everybody else that's showing out, but will certainly empower um, uh, some other data sets to uh, uh, to possibly fuse better or apply different weights, um, it won't go through. Uh, so it's very inefficient for translation because anytime that you want to add something new, you have to change the global standard. Now, the thing on the left, that is what we uh, oftentimes think about. It's like, why can't we just make everything the same? Let's make everything talk to everything. It's like, well, companies actually can't achieve this well for things that that uh, that that are more than than two or three. And and and, and again, if you if you believe the null hypothesis I throw out there, which is we are in a constant state of change, uh, that not only do your data models have to um, uh, adapt at the same rate. Uh, of of your subsystem changes, but so do the transformations uh, to uh, to each other too. So that very uh, very quickly grows uh, to n squared possible number of things that you need to update. Whereas the common model in the middle, that's an n squared number. Every time that I want to make a change, I make it once. Everybody applies that, uh, and that's that's where our current approach is. What's uh, at least the DODs? What our approach is the far right. We actually just use uh, modern, um, nothing novel, computer science, graph theory, and category theory uh, to be able to describe uh, the relationships between these different systems. Said in a very simplistic way, if if one person on this call speaks German, you get the scene, uh, and another one speaks English, hey, how, how's it going? Uh, why do we need to learn French or German, uh, Russian or some other third party language in order to translate? Um, uh, and in, in doing so, um, you're actually creating more work for each of those two subsystems because those subsystems speak their natural language anyway um, and their own internal data models. So what we do is we capture those translations that people are going to naturally do anyway. Um, and we use modern compiler theory to actually then automatically generate all the new connections that we can figure out between uh, between the systems. Uh, said, uh, said in a different way, uh, the Rosetta Stone. Uh, between those three language, uh, think languages on there: um, demonic text, um, uh, hieroglyphics, uh, and uh, and an ancient uh, Greek. Um, we can still translate uh, to and from um, uh, English to um, uh, to hieroglyphics uh, just by knowing those core translations. We do the same thing. And in fact, this is used all over the commercial world. We're now applying it to our APIs. I said a whole lot before I asked for questions. Um, are there any so far? None in the chat yet. Okay. Cool. Interrupt away, please. Um, the the benefit we get from the far right one is for the same amount of n number of inputs that we make, we get an n squared possible number of combinations. Um, so we get the efficiency of, of the common model um, and the efficiency of translation on the far left. Now, oftentimes I, I get the question, and rightfully so, is, well, sure, but what about translation loss? Well, there's actually two kinds of losses. There's precision loss, uh, and there's information loss, or Claude Shannon, uh, Shannon information theory, uh, how everything works now in, uh, in, in the interweb. Um, there, if, if somebody, for instance, on the, on the black and white versus color model, if, some, uh, if there's a system that, uh, that puts out color codes, uh, but only is translating to a system that's monochrome, uh, yeah, there's going to be information that's lost here. Um, but I can then, uh, when there's additional systems that are both color inside of this community, I can, uh, I, I'm only then required to, to add the difference or the, uh, the, the, the information that's missing in order to get, get interoperability to the remaining rather than having to redo the work. And if you're ever uh, have done um, like uh, uh, data translation between uh, coordinate systems, uh, which is a huge problem as soon as you talk about intra-domain operations, um, those three by three micro multiplications is, is pretty much what we're doing here, but for, for, for data standards um, or data, uh, data models. Cool. Uh, a different picture of this is if we wanna get the things on the left, which is this classic OV1 uh, to interoperate, 
Uh, the graph on the right, which every dot is a message and the lines go in between them, are the interoperability um, uh, code uh, that, that we uh, relate. That thing on the right is the universal translator that allows the things on the left to have a custom coded babblefish that they will hear in their language when anything else is talking to them. Um, now, universal translators are science fiction, um, but uh, to extend the science fiction uh, uh, example, um, uh, any uh, universal translator on science fiction is going to have a limitation of whatever it's in, it, in its database. Um, so uh, as we add more and more, and currently we're, uh, uh, I've lost exact counts, we're on the order of about 300 individual unique subsystems that we've adapted uh, over the last uh, eight years, since 2016, basically. Um, uh, and not a full N squared interoperability, but we're able to get interoperability from the com different communities. And what I don't have a chart here um, uh, of is the actual lack of interoperability we have. One thing that we wanted and that we tried uh, and we uh, uh, mathematically uh, and, and, and every way that we, we saw possible, we thought that we could have one knowledge graph to rule them all, meaning that we were going to, and we did, take it upon ourselves to ingest as many ICDs, interface control documents, specs, um, APIs that we could in order to create that meta meta model, uh, two metas, um, uh, for everybody else. Turns out though, that our data schemas, our data models are so inconsistent that, uh, that oftentimes once you get about more than 10 subsystems trying to go and create a knowledge graph community, um, that's when it starts becoming so inconsistent that you have all these special local rules where it's no longer globally, at least in that uh, context of 10, applicable. Oftentimes, uh, I can do it with two. I could certainly give you examples uh, out the uh, out the Teams meeting here, um, uh, but unfortunately, those are at least CUI. Uh, but if you don't want the examples, uh, that that's certainly uh, is easier to do. Um, now, the throughput uh, uh, I mentioned the, the the OSI stack before because we separate these things out for the human layer. Uh, but then compile them down, our stack actually gets collapsed down uh, to only a couple. Um, uh, so one to two, depending on how many different cyber resiliency features in there. As a matter of fact, uh, when there's no cyber resiliency features added, uh, we're getting about 15 gigabits a second with latency um, that's, that's like 0.2 milliseconds. And that's all the way through. It's not just a translation in business logic, but that's end to end. As soon as we start putting the cyber resiliency encryption uh, machine authenticated code in there, we're basically uh, same latency, but basically down to about two to four gigabits a second, depending on how much cyber resiliency put in. Um, and and this, this, this is similar to anybody else that wants to apply our methodologies. Holy cow, this is a, this is a horrible chart. Um, but what I at least wanted to show you that here, I don't have a nifty graphic for this, but we have uh, a very regimented systems of systems engineering process where we start off with when somebody wants to create capability, um, we go identify what that specific capability is, abstract it away on the, on the upper left-hand corner here from the actual subsystems that they presume to be able to give that. Then uh, we start with what, uh, what subsystems they have. Um, I identify those, um, analyze the subsystems for, uh, for those uh, individual capabilities, uh, and, then, uh, and then go create architecture and hopefully ontology before we ever work on the implementation. That's in the upper left-hand corner. That is a big OODA loop uh, just with determining requirements. Um, and, and what subsystems are. Now, why, why I'm bringing this chart up is that what we do is systems of systems engineering, which is a variant of systems engineering. Those two things are uniquely different. Uh, same trunk of, uh, of, uh, of knowledge sets, but what systems engineering is, our standard V in the DOD, it's how do we design our system right um, based on the requirements. We want our system to be exact as, uh, as, as, as was required, V and V with, with all our specs. What we're doing in the systems of systems engineering process is selecting which systems, um, which systems are right for the capability that we're trying to create, which often starts an, an unfortunate uh, side effect of what we do. Because we in integrate are uh, the as-is systems that are out there, uh, we often get into conflict with the subsystem owners because we very specifically concretize their capability. Uh, and if you've ever been on a, in a program office, uh, a PEM shop, a requirements board, um, you fight tooth and nail for the funding that you get. And if you've got some 
some stick monkey like myself come in and tell you your subsystem only does X, Y, and Z and not the A, B, and C that you have, and I'm trying to be as polite as I can, um, you're probably going to take umbrage of that, and that's where conflict or friction starts. So we're, we're not trying to uh, create uh, friction. Uh, what we are trying to do is identify exactly what the subsystem does, not as what, what's required, but all this stable state space and the unstable state space that we can know about that system. So we can then uh, apply appropriate cyber uh, resiliency features uh, and then go integrate secure systems by design. Meaning that if I know there's a certain um, uh, message uh, combination that will cause a conflict or a crash inside your system, which we find all the time, easy to find. Um, we can actually encode protections to prevent that. Um, this, this picture really just describes as we go and decompose each of the different subsystems for uh, line of bearing, um, RF capability, um, bandwidth, uh, hop rate, et cetera, um, we come up with a very potpourri picture of, of what we could use. And then we as systems as systems engineers, and hopefully, hopefully you, if you ever want to participate, um, will actually then create or compose a system of system out of what's deployed. Now, we try to do this in the most non-invasive way, meaning that if we can adapt systems that are highly connected, like a data link or a C2 node, then we get a lot of uh, rate of return for when we start deploying it. When we uh, first start with edge devices, let's say we just start with sensors uh, and then go integrate that in the C2 nodes, um, uh, we, we're going to do that anyway. But it takes uh, it takes longer to integrate things that only can talk to one, like an edge uh, edge sensor. The the uh, so we we generally try to start with things that can talk to more. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, uh, our, our own language, Stitches, is its own computer um, uh, language and initially based off of ML, modeling language, not machine learning. Uh, there's no AI inside of Stitches. It's all deterministic um, capability. Uh, but, but just by taking that system on the left, um, our academics actually goes through and shows you how you can make and create that. So the, the innovation that really came out of this in DARPA is how do we create systems of systems or sorry, how do we create capability via rapid system to system creation so that we could um, be inside that counter uh, that measure countermeasure OODA loop uh, that we so often find ourselves in? Um, there are basically three ways we kind of categorize integration. Um, there's interest subsystem. So you got some new algorithm, you want to plop on something. The, uh, the actual um, subsystem itself, so like an aligned replaceable unit, LRU, um, things like uh, an actual radar, electronic warfare. And then there's the inter um, uh, system from like one aircraft to another, one dissimilar aircraft to another. Uh, now for us, uh, truth be told, those are all the same types of integration. But, but the reason I break those out is because uh, those often serve as boundary conditions of where we prefer to start. Um, i.e. the intra subsystem, if I were to go put uh, or want to go put a new um, uh, uh, algorithm inside of somebody else's subsystem, chances are good that's work that could be or already is being done by a SPO. Um, so where we prefer to start is at the boundary of a program office or a subsystem, because that's generally where we get the least amount of friction between what people are doing. Um, uh, and there are very few of zero SPOs at all um, that actually do that work. Uh, there's obviously JATC2, uh, C3BM, uh, and the like. Um, uh, but, uh, but in terms of SPO, the, the way in SPOs, the way we do interoperability now between SPOs is voluntary um, or really based on multiple requirements uh, that evolve those kind of standards over time. Um, and I kind of went over this uh, of how we generate it, but that it generates the stack um, that's there in the green. Uh, I won't detail any of that here, um, nor will I talk about in detail this, but uh, I will if there are any questions about it. Um, there's two ways that we deploy code, either, um, and, and what we generate is source code. Uh, and why is that? Um, because each one of the systems that exist, whether it be you know, the components that go inside your, uh, your major weapon system, uh, the components that go, uh, that, um, uh, that go in between uh, systems like uh, Link 16, et cetera, um, those all have the notion of uh, basically their own CICD process if they have something that's labeled a CICD process. So if we generate code, we can actually go um, uh, then complete our, uh, the pipeline with each and every one of those 
um, uh, those pipelines that exist. So then uh, you can either use the binaries that we create, or we can uh, we can be in accordance with your specific uh, methodology uh, based off of the the security requirements of your system. Um, so if you can believe it, and you probably will easily, uh, is that there's no standardized CI/CD process, especially when you have multiple compilers, multiple tool sets that exist out there. Well, I wish that uh, uh, most of us wish that to be true. Um, everybody's different. Um, the three things that we need, and it's actually uh, um, uh, was was part that went into uh, the NDA 2021, specifically a Section 804 uh, statute is we take the subsystem specifications. Uh, and what that means is just the inputs and outputs from the ICD uh, create a, a computer model or a machine readable version of that in our Stitches uh, um, computer language. Um, and then that becomes a database. We then, we have the, uh, um, the system of system specification uh, that becomes a separate set of file inputs in a database, as well as the actual, um, uh, the, the, what we call a field and transform graph for the knowledge graph I described, those that becomes a third based input. Um, and then when we take all those three things together, stitches the tool chain, compiles that down and outputs the code. Uh, currently we output C++ uh, uh, 80, uh, 90, uh, excuse me, uh, 2003, um, 2011, um, uh, C90 and Java 8. Why those? Uh, because generally speaking, there's enough compilers uh, from there uh, from any subsystems out there that can continue that through. People want to run in other languages. Uh, we make it uh, um, straightforward to tap in. All of this code is government unlimited rights. Basically, it's under an MIT-like license. So people can manipulate it, do, that, all, uh, do with it what you want. Um, if you've heard the term, and this is where it'll it maybe get a little contentious here on the phone, um, but by all means, chime in, please. Um, if you ever heard the, the concept that, hey, we're going to containerize things to help with interoperability, Unfortunately, that's that's a fallacy. And why is that? Because um, containerization makes it possible for you to shift code within your architecture. But every time that somebody else containerizes um, Kubernetes clusters, Docker, et cetera, it's specifically tailored to the system that you're creating it around. Specifically, the, the underlying um, uh, operating system, the OSs that, that containerization is bound to makes it so that those containers can be smaller because it passes the dependencies onto the OS. So if you have one container that's designed for, uh, for Red Hat Linux 8 and another one that's uh, designed for Windows 11, those things have two completely different dependency sets, which means what we've done in order to solve this problem is actually create um, uh, the middleware that will allow the interoperability to occur, not just for translation, but also the business logic uh, and the um, uh, basically the dependency matching uh, that go between it. Um, so whether we deploy into a, a Docker itself or a Kubernetes cluster um, or standalone, uh, basically we work in all these different types of environments. So the reason for bringing this up is we're not just how do you make feet into meters, but how do you make one um, uh, virtualized architecture work with a different virtualized architecture? We have many examples of this, and this is generally where we spend a lot of our time, uh, worthwhile time on, is how do you make two different architectures work together? Um, are there questions on this? Because sometimes uh, this gets uh, fuzzy. Hi, Rev. This is Dr. Joe Matola. Uh, we interacted about a year ago, and uh, this is my question is related. So at that time, uh, going from an ICD to a spec in the Stitches language was a lot of work, and there weren't many tools. It looks like you've streamlined that. Could you say a little bit about how that? Uh, uh, tool chain uh, fits in here with uh, cloud virtual machines and so forth. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question, and uh, good to hear from you again. Um, good, uh, good interactions from uh, from the last couple of years. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so uh, what what I haven't mentioned yet, uh, and I'll, this is a perfect uh, perfect kind of opportunity to, to do it now, is that uh, that Stitches is, is is starting its next phase of life. Uh, and what does that mean? Uh, we've uh, we integrated uh, what I like to call nerds in the edge, but we're, what we're focused now on is is how do we actually uh, enable that backend or or the SPO or the uh, the contractor group that would want to uh, to bring things in, bring their subsystem in, and get to a system a system as fast as we can. 
what we've um, what we've done in the past is exactly what you just uh, what you, what you uh, uh, recalled. Um, is we spent a lot of time on the specification and the subsystem adaptation working with SMEs. What we're doing inside of Integration Prime, which is a, which is in one of the primes, a variant uh, within AFWorks uh, for the Air Force, is, is creating two things. One that we call a secure integration kit and another one we call a gauntlet box. Um, a secure integration kit is how do I actually take um, and make tools, uh, as many automated tools as I can to help a subsystem owner take their ICD, scrape it, turn it into a knowledge graph of the dependencies that we need, um, generate the code for them. And then the gauntlet box is there to provide a score of how well you did to human engineer um, the humans uh, to actually uh, follow best practices. So while those tool sets and automations are still being uh, uh, developed more broadly, um, we're about ready to release our development kits. Uh, uh, I'd say by, by the end of the calendar year, but what we're trying to do for Integration Prime is have this stuff ready for one, uh, really the, the first week of uh, January, because we're going to start in calendar year 24 by deploying these things. We're making these available so that OEMs can do this work themselves. And then we can judge based on the score of how ready they are and how much additional help they need. So can they plug into the architectures uh, that we're working on for what specifically our distributed uh, resilient sensor net next year? I don't know that I answered Great, your, your whole that, question. No, that's, that's really good news. Thank you. Okay, cool. Did I over answer your question? I apologize if I did. <laughs> I don't think so. Okay, thanks. Uh, any others? And we do have uh, uh, some in the chat if you wanted to go over Please. them. All right, it was a little bit earlier, but from Paul R. Uh, he says, new communication standards developed around an extremely unique AI provisioning development is awaiting, is awaiting creation. The OSI model is very old and outdated. APIs will become hexadecimal AI verified encrypted handshake. TCP slash IP packets are 50 years old and the main cybersecurity issue. Forward-looking visionary awaiting funding. How much of our communications are AI driven for pro propagation? A communication system for today and the future must be AI driven. New intelligent hexadecimal AI based language is required. This isn't chat GPT. A system like robotics is required for communications. Uh so uh, I, I agree with you, but was there a question in there? Uh, otherwise, I can riff off of that. He said, how much of our communications are AI driven for propagation? Um, so I'm unaware of any that are currently deployed. Um, I know that there are a number of folks that are working on specific communications. Um, uh, I think one good example is uh, is the C10 effort um, that uh, that is uh, that is operated by um, uh, by by the Air Force. Uh, it's an efforts consortium in order to find um, uh, uh, new ways to abstract uh, abstract existing um, uh, communication layers, uh, Link 16, VMF, etc. Um, uh, now, whether or not they're applying AI to that methodology, I can't say, but but they they have a very good effort right now um, that is uh, that is that is geared towards that. Matter of fact, um, uh, oftentimes uh, uh, stitches in C10 appear in the same uh, same sentence. Uh, but uh, but but more specific to your question, um, uh, they're working on on how do you get um, information from one source to one destination across an irrelevant number of uh, of of data layers or transmission layers in between. Now, what do I mean by irrelevant number is because those senders and the, the, the transmitters and the users, they don't care. When, when, when you and I are talking right now, um, you could care less, maybe you don't, I, maybe, I have no idea, um, that, uh, that how it gets from me sitting in a, in, in a, in a walk plots in Germany all the way over to you, um, it just works. Um, and that's what they're trying uh, to do is just make uh, those abstractions work. Now, whether or not that's AI-based or can be AI-based, um, uh, that's, that's, uh, that, that's up for debate. Uh, Dijkstra algorithms still work, uh, but once you abstract, uh, that, uh, communication like they're doing, um, uh, it, it opens up the possibilities for all sorts of different control mechanisms and data management routing, which could be AI based, which I think they have plugins that are available for. Um, did I understand your question? I believe so. And we do have two more. Please. 
So next from Major Joseph Hahn, have you considered utilizing compiler to cha- tool chain front end such as LLVM to be able to target for variety programming languages? That is a, that, that's a, that's a great question. Um, uh, no, yeah, so the answer is, is yes, and we do. Um, now, uh, I, I'll, um, I'm stuttering because uh, I, I can't recall if we actually use um, LLM or LLVM rather, um, low language virtual machine, I believe, or virtual messaging. Um, it's a, it's actually, a, uh, it's a, it's a standard that was created out of University of Illinois. Uh, again, just know that for happenstance. Um, that uh, that was an uh, an open source like practice in order to solve that abstraction between low level uh, machines, uh, languages, and high level. Um, we have several different layers in there. As a matter of fact, um, we have an entire compilation chain in ours. Uh, and, and why is this important for, for anybody else? Um, when you wish to use different tools like um, uh, formal verifications, um, AI models, um, uh, different languages that, that output uh, different things, Rust, et cetera, um, or different variants of, of low-level tools, um, you have to have a middle uh, language that is expressive enough to be able to transfer data from one module and one language to another module and other ones. Otherwise, we get information lost inside our compilation chain. So not only do we measure for that, we that is that is our core uh, capability inside of Stitches that we actually never talk about because nobody's ever interested. So yes. All right, thank you. And last question we have from uh, Captain Troy Soliu. I hope I pronounced that right. Shouldn't the orchen- orchestration manager or the container itself contain the runtime for the app? I don't understand what you meant when you said that containers are for OSs specifically and what you have in stitches to run containers. Yeah, uh, uh, good question. So let me let me break that apart to make it uh, make it more clear because because uh, uh, my explanation was probably confounded. Um, so just talking about um, containerization, um, w- uh, if um, just a uh, 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 one dimensional scale, large containers versus small containers. Let's say, um, and just a container is, is a block of, and this, I'm just explaining this generally because again, I'm assuming that we don't speak software the same. So I'm uh, using synonyms just in case. Um, uh, if, if you want to make a, um, uh, a space or a container that, that has the ability to run your code, you could either um, maximize that size by putting also an operating system inside it um, that, uh, that then becomes a virtual machine itself or extract as much as you can and pass the dependencies for um, different uh, different uh, device drivers, um, different things that, uh, that you can pull out and have run by a, a, a hyper or through a hypervisor in the OS, and they become as small as you can make it. The smaller you make it, the more highly dependent it is on that specific operating system. So I won't call it, there's a sweet spot in there, but generally speaking, as soon as you take it away from that large VM, virtual machine that is an OS in itself and make it smaller, there's some dependency that's now tied to that underlying system that you require so that I couldn't actually go from like Ubuntu, that uh, specific variant of Linux, to like, um, uh, not Solaris, but uh, but even uh, uh, just, just say Red Hat or Rocky Linux, any of those types of vari- uh, variants or um, uh, different ones, because I might have different dependencies and do uh, in each of those main Linux trunks. So what I mean by there's dependencies in there, um, I can't transfer between OSs. And that's oftentimes what we have on our, uh, on our real systems. Um, we have, uh, and I wanna give you exact examples, I just can't. We have systems that are still running Windows XP because they don't have the funding to upgrade. Then we also have things that are running um, uh, uh, basically Windows 7, not Windows 11, but Windows 7. And I can't run those, um, different software um, between them because they have different underlying security structures and uh, independencies. What we do at Stitches is capture what the differences are when we want to say like an electronic warfare app that's created from uh, one variant of Linux getting plopped into a different um, uh, um, system that uses a much, much different underlying uh, BSD code, for instance, or operating system. Did I get close to your question? So you're saying that you have basically a, a Docker compose that stitches compose or something like, right? 
Uh, yes, uh, so when we when we make one container from one architecture work in another, generally speaking, we have to have both those architectures up and running. Um, and whether or not uh, we have a, it's not a stitches component. Well, actually, um, it's called uh, build sauce. So we have um, relating to the previous question, when we run certain commands, it runs our own compilation chain. But we can also add that to a Docker compose in your. Let's say you have an architecture to work with mine. I can actually put that interoperability as part of your Docker Compose um, uh, or Swarm or Cluster or whatever you have. Did that make sense or did I miss your question? It's a good um, question. I, I, should... I, I think I'm just missing missing the uh, orchestration, uh, the element of if you have Docker because you can run Linux containers and Windows containers both you know, in the Docker runtime, um ah, yeah that was a, I, I mean I, i'm not i'm misunderstanding like um it, are you just saying that like kubernetes like i'm missing where kubernetes and docker are not um that's what the heart of my question is okay we don't cool. have to. Uh, so, no, no perfect let me actually it's it's, it's, it's a phenomenal question and one that it should be answered um uh, hopefully if, hopefully i can get on this one um if not we'll, we'll try again via email if that's cool um uh the the, the core lack of interoperability between uh, the different containerizations mechanisms directly tied to the word that you said, and that's orchestrators. Orchestrator is an approach for each one of these deployments of containers. If you're using Docker Swarm, it doesn't work with um, the, the Kubernetes clusters. I mean, they're just two increment ones. One's proprietary, one's uh, one's open standard, so that you can actually have a container that's built for a Docker Swarm go plopped into something that runs Kubernetes because it's still looking for that Docker Swarm or, um, orchestrator and all the other dependencies that it's looking for. So when we try to take a container and put it to another one, we actually don't do it that way. We run both architectures simultaneously and make the inter interoperability between those architectures. Is that partially satisfying? You have multiple orchestrators. Um, if we we have two, well, if we're making two different um, uh, architectures work, there's an orchestrator in each. So an gotcha. n number of architectures means an n number of orchestrators. Okay. Okay. Good. And we have one hand. Did you have time to take that, um, Akil yeah, or Silla? Um, yes. Yeah, so. In 2019, nearly 4,000 data breaches took place in the United States, exposing over 4 billions of records in education, government, healthcare, and uh, et cetera. So what type of security we have in place for these stitches? Good question. Uh, this is a great question. I love it. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, there is uh, like a seminal paper for us. Uh, is, it was a study that we did early on. Uh, bottom line up front, to answer your question immediately, um, there are five things that we want to be able to protect for. We can only, based on modern state of the art, protect for four of them. Those four are the following. Um, we, can, uh, we can lock down systems using um, some sort of certificate like machine authenticated code, where we deploy a cert, uh, know what, uh, what, what, that, what each subsystem is. Um, we can encrypt the data lines using TLS 1.1 or some other commercial grade encryption or military grade encryption we're gonna put in there, and then whitelisting and blacklisting. But we do that, um, and I'll talk about the fifth one here in a second in, in the screen that I have up. Uh, we apply security by first securing the the, uh, the runtime environment of the system so that the only interactions that are allowed are through the data channel that are created. And then we lock down that data channel. So we've created this thing in such a way that we if you uh, that we assume there's going to be a nefarious system in and amongst our system systems. And that when that occurs, um, if we have enough resiliency in there, we can mitigate or zero uh, detect that uh, that nefarious system, prevent it from talking by uh, whitelisting, blacklisting. Obviously, DDoS denial of uh, uh, services uh, uh, can and will pose a problem at some point. Um, but uh, but those are the four methods. The fifth method is what I have up here. If I apply all four of those things, which do a phenomenal job, which you don't need stitches for, you can go do all those things yourself. You get the equivalent, and uh, this, I'm going to give you a BS number and explain why I, I gave it to you in a second. Um, you get about a reduction from anywhere a guesstimate between 95% vulnerability 
all the way down to five five percent. Um, again, it's bullshit. The BS number. Uh, I'll tell you why in a second. Um, the fifth thing that we can't do. Um, the, the four things we can, the fifth one we can't. If I assert all of those different ways to authentic, uh, authenticate you, um, lock in the, the channel, but for some reason, some operator on, on one of the subsystems plug their phone up to a USB stick and becomes nefarious, I, I don't have anything to do about internal hygiene. So when that occurs, if, if you are a trusted agent um, and, and you're pwned, um, I still have to do data analytics on the data that's allowed through um, because stenographic communications is basically the last left um, um, uh, uh, way to get through because uh, you can encode things all you want uh, through those things. Uh, but that, that is a risk. As soon as you find somebody that can solve the, the stenographic communication problem, um, then we solve the fifth thing and we can get as secure as we know how to. Um, now, the reason why I told you that was a BS answer is because we have no absolute value of how vulnerable our systems are because it requires absolute knowledge of state um, to determine how vulnerable they are. And frankly, we only know what they're either required to do or some semblance of, of bare, uh, un, uh, uh, unstable state and stable, uh, stable state in, in the cyber sense. Um, so what we did is we created this huge uh, uh, model um, of system-to-system uh, -system interaction where we took 100 different known vulnerabilities, modeled those, and then created large-scale um, runtime events uh, that went through all the different possible combinations or at least uh, uh, a sampling of possible variations uh, to, uh, to help us guide how best we can go secure systems if we only had access to, uh, to locking down the channel. Um, so that's, that's my answer, the long answer. Um, did that help answer? Did I understand your question? Because yes, thank you. you the cool. Now, what I want to talk about here, only if there's time. You're still good on time, yes. Perfect. Uh, by the way, if I do cut out, it's because uh, my battery went dead, but I don't think that's going to happen for another 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> um, what I want to talk about here is we had to figure out a way, if we have a subsystem that produces information that's not compatible with the, the information, uh, or sorry, the, uh, the transportation layer um, uh, to be able to get through to the other side. Uh, now, without using specifics, because again, this is a, a public releasable uh, uh, thing, let's just talk about uh, 1553 buses. Uh, 1553 bu uh, buses, uh, you know, it's uh, basically 20 bytes, 20 bits uh, at a time uh, sending through, or uh, a little bit more than that, but uh, uh, along with the, um, uh, the header of where things are going, um, generally speaking, if I want to plop uh, 50 bytes of data uh, on, a, on a 20 byte message, it's, it's, it's gonna be overloaded right away. So I had to figure out, we had to figure out how do you actually tunnel data through if we knew the properties of the message. Um, and in fact, since we apply and know the properties of each message, um, uh, like for instance, if you have a lat long, it's plus minus 180, plus minus 90, um, uh, while well, you might say that it's only those values, like, well, I can actually encode a lot in those 31, 32 bits, depending what type of message format it is, to send data through, not just in the, uh, uh, the least significant digits as in the nefarious case, but actually use the entire bit uh, model, and we actually automatically analyze this. So we generally speaking get about uh, 80 to 90 percent um, reuse payload capacity as a truck uh, per message going through where we actually then choose what message we want to use based on how efficient it is to get through. So um, we can't solve uh, so that we, we still have to adhere to Shannon information theory, meaning that if we're trying to fit uh, 12 pound messages through a five pound soda straw, it's going to take us three messages um, and, and use your bandwidth. But you do this when you have sensor data or some sort of fusion data that's coming out that's absolutely critically needed to get over a Link 16 or VMF um, or some other, some other network that uh, you only have fixed formats going through. So this is an example of what I described before, of the four things I can solve. This is an example of the fifth way that we've enabled blue-to-blue -blue engineering um, and also can monitor that. Now, for, for actual tactical systems, we put these things on different channels because we find all the time subsystems don't do don't behave well when they uh, when they even get uh, when they get the messages outside of the one, two or three that they're expecting um, that oftentimes they don't guard for what they should guard. So we put these on different channels.
but this is an example of stenographic communications used to transfer data over existing fixed form message sets. As a matter of fact, um, the the AI methodology that uh, the previous gentleman was uh, was asking about um, about over communication, we we enabled this without having to use AI, but certainly you could use AI to uh, um, to do uh, much much larger at scale if you want. That's kind of all I wanted to go through. Um, I do have a couple of examples in here, but bottom line is we're now in a state where we're um, uh, at least in terms of stitches, we we have more things to do than we have people. Um, uh, uh, Joe brought up a great question uh, about how do we actually scale this or how do we actually make it more efficient? And um, that's what we're working on right now. So how do you actually minimize or zeroize the need for a stitches expert to adapt your subsystem? Uh, and we're doing that through um, uh, through FRL FWorks's integration prime. Um, uh, that's, uh, that, that, that we're going to have a year long, uh, event next, uh, starting in calendar 24. Um, uh, we're doing that through the Bravo hackathon where we actually using the information system itself to be able to share data and integrate things. Um, and, uh, basically, uh, we are integrations of service. Uh, we don't assert what we're doing, um, uh, is the way that you should do it. We're using our capability to make what you're doing interoperable with somebody else's who also can't change. So any other questions you guys got? Or BS flags, if you got any of those, I'd love them. Cool. I'd show you my face, but uh, but it's in a parking lot and it's, uh, it's, it's midnight here, almost. No flag seen over here. There's Going once. Up. Oh, th that was uh, from Mr. Arcilla earlier. Got it. Well, cool. that, lots of great information there. I'm sorry. Did you want to have any closing remarks? Uh, well, <laughs> I just talked for an hour and 15 minutes, so um, we'll, we'll close at that. But no, it's, 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 uh, I appreciate uh, you inviting me. Um, hopefully this was uh, worth your time. Um, I appreciate it. Absolutely. The, and we do have one comment or one question from uh, Frank Wingbrace. He says, where can we learn more on Stitches? Um, you can go to www.stitches.mil. Um, you got to type in www because of uh, uh, DNS uh, uh, forwarding. Um, you go there, request an account, um, uh, get you get you signed up, um, and uh, basically as long as you're a U.S. person uh, and have uh, and, and basically it's D, uh, CUI, Distro D, and ITAR capabilities, um, you can get it. That includes contractors, uh, DoD contractors as well. Um, so we get, uh, keep all of our unclassified CUI material there. Uh, we also have a site that just stood up a couple weeks ago uh, on Sipper, um, uh, which uh, which is not ready for you to use yet because we're still porting data up. Um, but uh, but the same capabilities in the in the site to include live virtual machines, Jupyter notebooks, GitLab uh, exchanges that people are using. It's going to be available on Sipper as well as Offensive Subsystems. Um, so uh, uh, you can also email me if uh, which I think you have in the um in the description of the uh the invite uh, and i'll get you get you that website uh as well awesome thank you so much and it's a, a wealth of information lots of great information i certainly appreciate you breaking down the the complexity with your analogies they were really really good so i appreciate that but before you're in oh your uh, your emails in the uh, chat for for all those looking for it as well that was a, a great talk from dr joe matola he says thanks a bunch so before your battery dies, we just want to thank everyone for joining the final Innovation Connect for 2023. We are grateful for your continued support of DOD innovators and the DAF CDAO. We have several pioneering projects underway and anticipate featuring even more in 2024. To stay up to date on up upcoming events and registration information, follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter, newly named X. Approved videos of our past events are available on the Department of Air Force CDAO YouTube page. And as always, we welcome your recommendations for future Innovation Connect topics to our DAF CDAO communications mailbox. Thank you for your participation, and we look forward to seeing you again in the new year. Thanks, all. See ya.